Teaching Toolkit Technologies. Lovely to have you here. And it's great to be able to talk about the Technologies Toolkit finally. Very exciting. So thanks for joining us. I acknowledge that it's the last week of term and very pleased to see how many of you are turning up in the waiting room to be to join us for this session. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we all come to this session, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I am beaming to you from Wurundjeri to land today, so uh, pay my respects to their elders. Okay, so we've got, first of all, I'll just uh, introduce myself. My name is Narisha Lang and uh, I'm an education consultant here in Victoria. And uh, I am a former primary school principal and now I mainly do most of my work around the in literacy. You can see me on all of the pipes there. I'm at Rissell on Twitter and I'm Auslet Teacher on Facebook and Instagram. And my email address is nerissalearning at gmail. Just in case you're wondering, I don't have an edu mail or education mail email address. There is a Narissa who works at Basto. Please don't email her. <laughs> she does get a few of my emails. So if you do want to get in contact with me, my email address is nerissalearning at gmail.com. And there is a photo of me pre-COVID <laughs> when I used to brush my hair every day. Everyone remembers what that's like, right? <laughs> All right. So tonight the structure is, and if you haven't joined us before, I just thought I'd give you a bit of an int introduction to the structure. Basically, um, I really believe in what the research says around the importance of talk. And I know that we can't talk face to face in this environment, but we do have the option of using the Padlet. So I've put a, an address on the website on the screen there, tinyurl.com forward slash lit teach tech, as in literacy teaching technology. And the idea of this Padlet is for you to share any thoughts that you have during this session, any connections, any resources, uh, and just to, this is our way of having a conversation because we can't obviously have it face to face. So I've used a quote from Fisher and Fry's book. This is Content Area Conversations. This is a really good book actually. And they say, the academic discourse of the classroom, both oral and written, is the conduit for learning. Students must be actively engaged in the academic discourse of the classroom if they are to understand the content. And that's why we have the Padlet, because we know that if I just stand here and talk at you for the whole night, you're not going to engage with the content and, and you know, really remember it and take it away. So we want as much as possible for you to contribute to the Padlet. So the address is on the screen there for you. Okay, so the understanding goals for tonight, we've got participants will understand the importance of explicit teaching of disciplinary literacy in the technologies classroom. And I'm going to talk about the different idea about technologies. What does that mean? Develop knowledge of a range of effective disciplinary literacy related teaching practices for the technologies classroom and deepen your knowledge of the range of supporting resources. Okay, uh, the success criteria for this you'll be able to describe reasons why explicit teaching of disciplinary literacy is important. And I'm going to define this disciplinary literacy. That is so hard to say really quickly. I'm going to define that. We'll start off by defining that. List a range of practical literacy-related activities for the technologies classroom. And then you'll be able to list some of the supporting resources. I can't possibly, I would love to, but I can't possibly teach you everything there is to know about literacy in the technologies classroom tonight. So it's really an introduction and that's why I'm going to direct you to different resources on the Literacy Teaching Toolkit so you can further your own knowledge in this area. So we're going to look at the what and the why of disciplinary literacy. We're going to look at the Technology Toolkit or the Literacy Teaching Toolkit technologies and uh, have a little bit of a focus on vocabulary and then on uh, writing instruction. So if you want to introduce yourselves in the Padlet, that would be great. I'd love to know uh, why you'll come to this session. Are you a literacy leader and you've been tasked with getting other people on board with literacy in your school? Or maybe you're a technologies teacher and you're really keen to find out how can I uh, strengthen the literacy practice in my classroom? So welcome to both sets of people. <laughs> and welcome if you've been to some of the other sessions too. So we're going to start off with the what and the why of disciplinary literacy. And 
I'm going to start off by actually defining what are we talking about when we're talking about this disciplinary literacy. So for some of you, that might be a really new concept and that's totally fine because we're going to, that's exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to start with a couple of quotes just to get you in the thinking about what is disciplinary literacy and then we can start to think about what's your role in this in the school. Uh, this comes from the, from the toolkit. Given the distinct ways different academic disciplines use language to make their own meanings, students need to develop differentiated literacy skills and strategies for interacting with the texts of each discipline. Now, this is important because my provocation, and I always start these sessions with the same provocation, is particularly in a high school setting, uh, the teachers in the other subjects might be thinking, well, literacy, isn't that the English teacher's job? Why do I need to teach this? So what I want to talk to you about is why isn't this just the, the role of the literacy te of the English teacher? Why does every teacher, particularly in a secondary setting, need to be a teacher of, of literacy? So here we can look at there's different ways that different disciplines use literacy, and that's one of the things that we've got to keep in mind. Uh, the second... It's no longer appropriate to talk about literacy across the curriculum. And this is a term that used to be used quite a lot. We, had a, we did have a big push on this for a while, literacy across the curriculum. Instead, there is a need to delineate curriculum literacies, specifying the interface between a specific curriculum and its literacies rather than imagining that there is a singular literacy that could be sped, spread homogeneously across the curriculum. OK, so what they're talking about here is we're saying that, yes, literacy is required, you know, reading, writing, speaking and listening, they're required in all of the subjects. But I guess we've got to be a bit more tuned in to the nuances of, of the types of literacy or how we go about the reading in different curriculum areas because that's not the same. So, yes, we might use the same skills of decoding um, understanding across all of the curriculum areas, but in each curriculum area they have their own little nuances and things that we need to turn the volume up on. So we've got to become aware of what these are and our teaching needs to recognise these differences. Okay, so if we have a look at, uh, let's have a look, whole school literacy, and this has been... Um, there's been there has been a big focus on whole school literacy in secondary settings in the past, and so yes, we went through a phase, and maybe your school is still working on this. And it's not to say that that's wrong; it's absolutely not wrong. There are um, general literacy. We're talking about things like the comprehension strategies. So we went, you know, questioning. How how might questioning look in an English classroom? Uh, as opposed to a maths classroom, as opposed to a technologies classroom. So we would, you know, sometimes we would sit down and would have a, a professional development session for all of the teachers in a school and we'd say, okay, well, this is what inferring is, this is a comprehension strategy, and now you've just got to think about how this might apply to you in your curriculum area, all right? Uh, writing to learn, that's something that goes across the curriculum. That's still a very valid uh, activity or approach, and then we've got vocabulary instruction. So often you'll see uh, whole high schools or whole schools, not just high schools, using um, a or well, having a, an approach to vocabulary instruction because we know the effect size of that is is so strong. And then the increase of accountable talk. So accountable talk is uh, that deep and rich conversation about the curriculum. It's not um, you know more talk in every classroom about what you did on the weekend. It's really focused talk. So these things are still valid, but when we start to talk about the nuances of, of what's required in each separate subject area, that's when we're talking about disciplinary literacy. So disciplinary literacy is focused on the way that experts in that discipline, how do they think, how do they, th how do they speak, how do they read, how do they write? Now, uh, we're going to look at what might this mean for the technologies classroom. They also, in disciplinary literacy, we're thinking about the specific language features of the texts of that discipline. So we've got to think, well, what type of text will our students be exposed to in a technologies classroom? So uh, are they ex do you, is it 
expected that they would be reading narratives? Probably not. Whereas in the English classroom, a lot of our instruction is going to be around narratives. So what are the text types that our students are going to come across? What are the text types they'll be expected to read and to and or to write in the technologies classroom? And that, that's when we need to, that's the one that we need to turn up the teaching on, those specific text types. And then we've got our discipline specific vocabulary. So, you know, in English, our students are going to be exposed to all these types of words and they're going to need to understand these ones. In maths, there's a whole other language. You know, science has its own language. Well, what's the language of technologies? So, whether that's design and technologies or whether it's digital technologies. And these are the things that we've got to start thinking about. What When we're talking about disciplinary literacy, we're really talking about the content first and then we're thinking, well, how, what are the literacy skills required to get our, skill, our students to be able to access that content? Okay. Right. So let me move on. Disciplinary literacy refers to the learner's ability to read write and speak in ways that are valued and used by people in a given discipline. That is to think like mathematicians, read like historians and write like scientists. So as teachers of technology or design and technology, then you are ex an expert in your field, hopefully, <laughs> or as close as an expert as you can be. So what we're trying to do is let kids in on the secret about how you go about reading and writing in your field. So probably an example of this for me is, you know, when I'm, if I'm, say I'm a woodwork teacher, um, which I could be because I did get 10 out of 10 on the wooden spoon that I made in high school. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> I don't know whether, whether that qualifies me to be a teacher or not. It's still working to this day, I might add. Uh, so if I were a woodwork teacher and I were trying to uh, read or I was trying to find out how to make something and I went and read, uh, you know, I found some instructions for how to put a table together, then how do I actually read that as, a, as an expert in this field? Do I read it from top to bottom? Do I read every single word before I put my hands on the wood? On the wood? Do I look for a specific section? You know, do I skim it and go, yeah, I just need the materials section? Or do I uh, sit down? Do I, you know, just read that section, skip forward, read another section? Do I look at the images first before I start reading the text? So these are all of the little insights that we've got to let our students in on so that it can help them to engage in the same text in the same way as you, the expert in your field. So this here, in order for us to help our students to think like designers or to read or write like designers, then as teachers we have to develop more metacognition or we need to be more aware of our own thinking when we're engaging in literate practices in our field. So when I am writing a report, you know, when, I'm de when I've designed something and I am writing a report to send it out, I've got to think to myself, oh, yeah, what, what knowledge did I need to write that? Or what were the things that I thought about? Or how, do I, how did I know how to structure that? Where did I get that information from? And when we develop our metacognition and, and our awareness of what we're doing as experts in the field, then we can help pass that information on to our students. All right. My husband tried to throw out that wooden spoon the other night. I couldn't believe it. It's still in good shape. Any wonder I got a 10 for it. Now, disciplinary literacy, just a couple of quotes um, and because I think these help us to refine what it is that we're talking about. Firstly, uh, Timothy Shanahan and Cynthia Shanahan say, say that disciplinary literacy recognises that literate strategies differ across the disciplines. So, you know, that's what we're talking about there. When we're reading a text, for example, in maths, I'm thinking I'm looking for numbers. That's all I'm looking for. I'm not, I'm not looking for a nice, engaging story. I want the numbers so I can work out what do I, got to put in the, what do I have to put in the equation when I'm reading a text in design and technology, I might be looking for something else. So my, the strategy that I use is going to be different, okay? We're going to go into that one in a bit more depth in a second. 
Disciplinary literacy means that literate strategies and discipline specific content are intertwined. Now, this means literate strategies and discipline specific content. This means that it's not a case of, oh my goodness, I've already got all this content I've got to teach and now you want me to teach literacy on top of it. Actually, no. It is that literacy works in service to the content. I have all of this content that I want my students to be able to access and if they don't have the literacy skills to be able to access it, then I've got to build their capacity to to use those literacy skills because it's helping them to receive that content. And without these literacy skills, they're not going to be able to engage successfully with that content. So which flows into the third point, disciplinary literacy enables students to develop their content knowledge, skills and understanding to become experts within a discipline. Now, of course, not all of our kids are going to go on and be designers or, you know, work in the digital technologies field, but we need to give them that opportunity to be able to. We've got to skill them up so at least it becomes an opportunity on their table that they can pick from when they leave school, you know, so they've they've got a wider future on offer to them. So really here we've got to think literacy isn't separate to the subject. Literacy is working in service to the subject. It is going to help me to deliver my content in a more effective manner because the kids are really going to understand what it is that I'm trying to teach them, all right? Now, what I, we're going to go deeper into that top point, recognises that literate strategies differ across the disciplines. I'm going to have a look at what, what are the differences But before I do that, I'm just going to introduce you to the uh, how the toolkit defines technology, okay? Let me have a look. Let's move ahead. So in the Literacy Teaching Toolkit, there is a section on literacy and technologies. Well, that's why we're all here. It's been separated into two sections. So one section is literacy in digital technologies, okay? So... We're talking about students using computational thinking and information systems to analyse, design and develop digital solutions. So that we're talk- you know, that's the computer sort of strand of digital of technologies. OK, so that's one half of the toolkit. The other half of the toolkit, we're looking at literacy and design and technologies, which is different to the digital technologies strand. So in the design and technologies Students use design thinking and technologies to generate and produce design solutions. So if you're a literacy teacher and you're thinking, okay, what's the difference between those two? The left-hand strand, we're really talking about the computer um, version of technologies. In the right-hand strand, we're going down to the, those four substrands, you know, like engineering, food and fibre. We're talking about materials and technologies. Okay, so they're they're two very different uh, strands, all talking about technologies, literacy and technologies. Okay, so if we go back to this idea of Shanahan's, that literate strategies differ across the disciplines, let's have a look at how do they differ. So if we go back to the provocation where I said uh, at the start, well, isn't this... Isn't literacy the role of the English teacher? Why aren't they teaching all of this? You know, I've got all my own stuff I have to teach. Let's have a look at what happens or what are the literate demands in the English classroom. So I'm going to start with reading. In English, for reading, we are expecting our students to be able to find meaning through literary techniques. So, you know, our students can, if they're engaging with a text and the type of text they're probably going to engage in is narrative, a fiction, um, maybe persuasive as well. So but heavily focused on narrative in uh, English for reading. So they're going to find meaning through literary techniques. So we're looking at similes, we're looking at alliteration, we're looking at metaphor, and we're being able to unpack those, say, the metaphors and try and work out what is the author really on about when they've used this metaphor in this text or in this way. We want our students to be able to identify themes. So if we've engaged in reading a novel, what were the main themes of the text? What were the takeaways for the reader? So these things are, I guess they're a bit abstract and and, and I guess there's some element of uh, 
grey area, you know, what the theme that you take out of the text might be slightly different to the theme that I take out of the text, depending on my background knowledge and my experiences. Uh, recognising bias of an of the narrator or of a piece of text. So say if we're reading, well, goodness me, wouldn't this be, isn't this a useful skill at the moment, recognising bias? So if we're reading, say, for example, some newspaper articles, uh, could we recognise the bias of the author of those articles if they were reporting on a current news event or a global pandemic? So that is a really important skill for students to be able to do in English as a part of reading. We want our students to be able to summarise, synthesise uh, and evaluate. The summarising and the synthesising is, is, really, is often about the narrative though, you know. So what's happened in the story up until now? How has how's your thinking changed about the characters? Uh, how do you think that character's growing? That type of thing. So we're, it's more uh, focused on the actual text. Making connections. We want our students in our English classrooms to be able to make connections between texts. So I'm reading The Hate You Give, I'm reading this novel right now and it's really making me think about this other text or it's really making me think about, you know, this part of a movie. Or the connections could be to self. So uh, when I'm reading, I was reading Archie Roach's autobiography recently, so I'm reading that and thinking, wow, this really reminds me of this that happened in my life or this person that, uh, that I know or this, you know, this experience. So we want our students to make connections the reason that we want them to make connections is so they can have a deeper understanding, comprehension of the text, yeah? Something we want our kids to do in English is to pay attention to the craft of writing. So that means when we're reading, we're not just reading the text, we're looking at it and thinking, wow, that was a really well-written sentence. I'm going to borrow that or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at that and think, how did the writer do that? Uh, I was reading a text recently, Azaria. It's a picture storybook that is just incredible. Uh, definitely useful for the high school, uh, for a high school audience. And the author of that book, Marie Coote, oh my goodness, her sentences were exquisite. And it's, it is actually about Azaria Chamberlain. It's the story of uh, what happened to her and the trial that her mum went through. It's a picture storybook. And when I'm reading that, I'm absolutely paying attention to the craft of the writing because it is so beautiful. And I look at it and I think, how could I write like that myself? And we want our students to recognise elements. So of the stories, of the poems, of the novels, you know, uh, how do they introduce the characters? How do they set the text out? That type of thing. Now, that's a lot of information for an English teacher to be communicating with their students. And that's just reading. You know, we haven't looked at writing. If we look at, and I'm going to, for this one, I'm going to use digital technologies as an example. If we look at what are the literate demands, what are the reading demands in the digital technologies classroom? Well, uh, and this isn't a comprehensive list, there's more. We want our students to engage, listen to, read, understand, and evaluate mainly informational texts. You know, it'd be very un uncommon to have a narrative text in, in the digital technologies classroom. We're really on about information texts and that's a different uh, set, that's a different lot of knowledge, isn't it, than looking at narrative and persuasive writing. Not to say that in English you don't look at information texts, but in digital technologies it is absolutely mostly informational texts. We also have to have a heavy focus on the symbols that are in these texts because digital technologies texts are, are symbol heavy. You know, if I'm reading a text, and when I say text, that could be a book, it could be a poster, it could be a set of instructions, uh, it could be a YouTube clip on how to create something, it's going to be symbol, icon and key term heavy in the digital technologies. You know, if I'm creating a code, if I'm using uh, a coding program such as Scratch, then I've got to be aware of what all of the different symbols might be that I need to know so I can understand that text. Our students in digital technologies, not surprisingly, are going to be engaging with lots of diverse media, so lots of multimodal text. Yes, in English, they might engage with multimodal text. They might look at websites and learn how to research information. But in digital technologies, those the types of multimodal text will be different. So again, we go back to our programming example using Scratch. We're going, how do you read that page? What do you look at first? What don't you need to look at on that page? So it's very different to reading a multimodal news article, right? 
Uh, we are interpreting diagrams and programming images. So we've got to be able to look at the, uh, in English, we might be looking at illustrations and trying to extract meaning. Here, we've got to be able to look at these diagrams or the, or the programming uh, flowcharts and we have to work out how do I interpret this? How can I extract meaning from this when it's just a bunch of lines, you know, some shapes and some words on a page? So it's a really different type of reading. Determine the validity of sources and the quality of evidence. Well, that just goes across every subject area. And then uh, for reading, recognise the different elements, say in informational text, procedural text. So we're looking at headings, we're looking at glossaries, all of those types of things. So you can see if we were to say, well, it's the English teacher's job to teach all of this, they've got an enormous list themselves of things that they need to focus on. And also we've got to think this list that I've provided here for digital technologies, there's another list for maths. There's another list for science. There's another list for the arts. So we can't possibly expect our English teacher to be able to teach all of these different areas. But the other thing is the English teacher isn't an, necessarily an expert in digital technologies. So they don't have that expertise on how do I enter, how do I read the code on this, how do I interpret this flowchart. So the digital technologies teachers, they're the experts in the field and we just need to help build their capacity to tap into their metacognition to say, yeah, how do, I, how do I read that? How did I know to read that from top to bottom instead of left to right, you know? So if we have a look now at the writing demands, I mean, that's just, that was just reading. For writing, we're looking at these and we're thinking, well, in writing, English writing, we're usually teaching our students about the process of writing, drafting, revising, editing, you know, we sort of go through that process, which we will go through in design and technologies as well, uh, but there's probably a heavier focus on it in English. We are talking about flexibility in, in using organisation details, etc. So if you think about it in English classroom, particularly if our students are writing a narrative um, or even actually, indeed a persuasive, the main purpose of that writing is often to engage the reader. So when we're writing in an English classroom, we're really wanting our students to engage their reader. Whereas when we're writing, say, in a design and technologies classroom, we're not so concerned with engaging our reader, we're con more concerned with informing our reader. So it, it leads itself to different style of writing. Yes, if we're writing persuasive in English, we still want to inform our reader, but if we're not doing it in an engaging way, they're going to put our piece of writing down. They're not going to listen to our message. So we've always got a really heavy focus on engagement and that affects our word choice, it affects our voice, lots of different things. So we actually, in the English classroom, we try and avoid formulaic writing. We don't want every single student in our class writing a persuasive thing that says, you know, th firstly, this is my first reason. Secondly, this is thirdly and in conclusion because it turns the reader off if we use that formulaic writing. But if you think about it, in design, we request formulaic writing. We want things to be written in a specific way and if they're not delivered in that way, then it can be confusing for us. So it's very different to the where we're saying in English, here's the rules and now, you can, now that you know them, now you can break them to engage the reader. In the technologies classroom, we're saying these are the rules and this is what your reader expects. So you need to stick to this format. Uh, in English, we want to use mentor texts. Now, mentor texts, I want to, you want to use those in every subject. Uh, mentor text is simply a an example text. It's, you know, in the hits where they say uh, worked examples, that's what it is. So it could be something you've written, which I would strongly recommend as being your number one go-to. Uh, it could be a published text. It could be a student text. You know, if they've done something really well, you want to highlight that and uh, show the other students so they can craft off that piece. Uh, so these are the skills that we need in the English classroom for writing. Now, if you think about design and technologies, so this is the right, you know, the second strand, not digital technologies, design and technologies, we're thinking most of the writing that our students do in this subject is to describe, explain, analyse, evaluate, maybe compare and contrast. So it's different to uh, engaging their reader. We, they're, they're doing a lot of composing in bullets, 
uh, in graphs and in sketches. So there's a lot more drawing and visual writing going on rather than what we're doing in the English classroom. We actually want to praise using a systematic format for their writing because it makes sense to the reader. You know, if we're writing, we're teaching our kids to write a recipe for uh, if they're in food technology, then we want there's the reader or the user, the, the chef, whoever it is, they have a formula. They expect they want their materials listed first so they can go and buy them. Then they want their instructions on how to put it together. If they're anything like me, they'll start reading the instructions and then realise the thing was supposed to marinate for 10 hours. That was me last night. So there's a there's a recipe for how to create a recipe. And if you stray from it, it might work, but more often than not, it won't work. In design and technologies, we seek exactness over craft. So in English writing, we want to we really promote craft, which means, uh, you know, we might throw in some alliteration. So in, in the design and technologies classroom, we're probably not going to say get out six silver spoons because it sounds nice. We want exactness. So we're going to tell the reader exactly what they need. You need two spoons, two t- and then you have to be even more exact, don't you? Two tablespoons, all right? So you've got to be exact rather than flowery and pretty and engaging as you would in the, in the English classroom. We have to use precise vocabulary. So we do have to refer to a tablespoon rather than just a spoon. And uh, we've got to learn how to create a coherent information, explanation, and and maybe even a persuasive text if you're trying to convince someone. Maybe if you're in the um, textiles classroom, you want to convince someone to use a specific fabric over another one because it's more sustainable, then you're going to need to use persuasive, right? So you can see there's an enormous difference in how we use. So, yeah, we're using reading and writing, so we use those in all subjects, but there's a nuance for digital technologies and for design and technologies. And as the expert on what happens in that field, we want to build the the skills of the technologies teacher to uh, help our students to develop the skill, the literacy skills that they need. So I want you to think about If you had to name the most important literacy-related skill that students need in technologies, what would it be? What would be, what would you think? If you're, say if you're a technologies, a design and technologies teacher, what's something that you, you know, when you're trying to get the kids to engage with a specific content and they just keep stumbling, what would you think or what would you like the students to know Or which literacy skills would you like them to have to be able to better engage in your content? So I'll be curious to see uh, what your thoughts are. If you had to name the most important literacy-related skill in technology, either strand of technology, what would it be? Interesting. Maybe it's vocabulary. Maybe Maybe it's actually writing the report, if they're saying design and technology, writing up the report. Maybe it's interpreting uh, the customer's concerns, don't know, communicating. Be interested to see what you've got to say. Now, we can't expect our students to know how to do all of these skills that I've just listed. And that, again, it's not a comprehensive list. If we don't step them through the gradual release of responsibility. So this is something that, well, all good teaching is reliant on the gradual release of responsibility. This model here that I'm using, I, I really like this one. It's Fisher and Fry's model. That It's the updated version of Pearson and Gallagher's model. That Pearson and Gallagher created it in the 80s and this is the updated version of it. So the gradual release of responsibility is really, I, I think this is the best guide for teachers to evaluate, you know, how are they supporting their students. So basically it starts at the top here where we've got the f- I do it. So you might know this is the I do, we do, you do sort of model, uh, except you'll notice that there's a fourth layer in this one, which is that's the um, the extra layer that Fisher and Fry added. That's the you do it together. So in the I do, so if we go up to the top, yeah, this is, and if you think about any skill that you've learnt, right, so if I think about, um, well, let's go back to my successful wooden spoon experience because clearly it meant a lot to me, <laughs> my 10 out of 10 wooden spoon. So in the first step, in the, in the focus lesson, our teacher, Mr Knight, 
who I will say did go out with my mum when he was in high school and he did mention that when he was giving me a 10 out of 10, but I really don't affect that. I do not think that affected the, the, the score. I think it was purely craftsmanship. He showed us what to do. He stood up the front and he said he got his piece of wood and he said, this is what I'm doing. And as he was doing it, he said out aloud what he was thinking. So he said, you know, I'm using this thing. I don't, I've lost all of the, t- the technical vocab. Uh, I'm going to use this saw to do this and then uh, go out and do this and then I'm going to, you know, do this around the side. I'm going to do this. And then, and so he modelled it for us and then he, and he was thinking aloud as he did it. In fact, he modelled it one step at a time. So he modelled it, sent us all off and uh, wished us luck, I might say. This is in year seven, I think, um, when I was still working out what a hammer was. And then he brought us back and then he'd model the next step for us, always telling us out loud what he was thinking. So then in the second section, guided instruction. So I think I think of that that first section, the, um, the focus lesson, I think of that's when the teacher is in front of the students, yeah? Then we go into the we do it section and I think of this as when the teacher is beside the student. So this is when he's walking around the room very quickly worked out who needs extra assistance and who doesn't. I don't think he'd realise at this stage who who, who he's dealing with, whose daughter he's dealing with. <laughs> so then he would go around and he'd, he'd help us and he would help us to be successful with whatever he had showed us at the start of the lesson. Now, the next sec- section is collaborative. This is the you do it together. So where he was in front of us and then... He was beside us and then collaborative learning. I think if this is sort of like you're beside them but you're off to the side. So you've got your ears open, you've got your eyes open and you're just sort of taking in data. So you're just saying, is this working? Are they getting this? I want to listen into their conversations to work out what, are they, what do they know, what have they taken on board. This is the last step before we release them off to independence. So the the final layer there you can see is the you do it alone. That's when we've released our students off to independence so they can have a go at this. Now, I think this is absolutely the best model for us to reflect on our teaching because I think when, so I see some of the things that you guys have listed in the chat here. Yes, making connections. It is very important. Someone said it might not be important, but it's very important. Making connections, using their prior knowledge, communicating. Okay, so let's take communicating as an example. I'm sitting here, I'm really frustrated. My kids can't communicate and they need to be able to communicate because they've got to work out what is their customer's design brief. You know, how they've got to come up with their design brief for their customer if we're in design and technologies. And they're not good at listening. They're not good at working out what information do they need. So I've got to think to myself, well, which one of the phases, which one of the levels on this gradual release of responsibility have I exposed them to? Have I modelled for them demonstrated for them what I'm expecting of them and when I demonstrated was I really explicit you know did I did I actually say what was coming into my head the first thing I'm thinking about when I'm asking these questions is what information do I need and then I'm thinking about what type of questions could I ask to get that information so are we really being explicit and have we then stepped our students through that guide and have we give them a little go with us on you know guide on the side or have we gone straight down to independent practice and then realised that actually they're going to need more support than this? I've got to pull myself back up the gradual release of responsibility. So this I think we've really um, got to think about, and it's not just for literacy teaching. This is for all teaching, as demonstrated by Mr Knight's amazing woodworking skills. The important thing to note for the gradual release of responsibility is that it isn't, doesn't have to be linear. And Fisher and Fry say that in their book. So we don't have to start with demonstration and then then go down, down, down to independent practice. However, over a unit, our students need to have exposure to all four phases. Now, the reason for this is that last sentence there, because we want our students to learn deeply, think critically and creatively and be able to mobilise learning strategies. That's, I think that's the most important part. We want them to mobilise learning strategies, which means we want them to be able to carry them around and use them whenever they see fit, okay? So that's what we've got to think about with gradual release of responsibility. If we give them exposure to all of those four levels, then they're really going to get, get into the deep part of learning. So when we think about disciplinary literacy, we've got to think 
or have. When, when I've got this big long list of things I need my students to be able to do in the technologies classroom, have I guided them through the gradual release of responsibility or have I assumed that someone else, i.e. the literacy, te the English teacher or the primary school teachers, have taught all of this to the students and they will come to my class knowing all of this. All right. Wow. Well, that was a lot of information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you have a resource pack uh, and I think Laura will have put a, a link in the chat if you didn't get it. Just to th And if you didn't get it, just, do it, just have a think about uh, what was new information for you about disciplinary literacy, what questions do you have, uh, and what squared with your thinking, so what's being confirmed for you. Sometimes people view the confirming part as a waste of time. Well, no, if knowledge has been confirmed for you, great, because then your confidence is strengthened in that. So thinking about disciplinary literacy, uh, what's... What's new knowledge for you? What was old knowledge for you? And what questions do you have? I'm going to give you two minutes to think about that and I'll put my fancy timer on up in the top corner here. Okay, everyone. I know two minutes isn't a long time, but it's hopefully just enough time just to think about, okay, out of all of that, what was important for me, information for me to take forward uh, and just give yourself a bit of a time to sit and reflect. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to step you through the Literacy Teaching Toolkit, the technologies side of it. Uh, before I do that, I'll just give you an overview. So in the chat, you, it'd be great if you could let me know what's your knowledge of the Literacy Teaching Toolkit. Uh, have you used it? Have you had the opportunity to have a little poke around yet? So let me know. I just read uh, I read all of your introductions. Lovely to see all of the, the spread of people that we have and so thrilled to see that we actually have some design and technology wood and vet teachers here. And I think Gary is, um, that might be Gary from Bendigo. Hello, Gary. Okay, so the Literacy Teaching Toolkit, what is it? Well, it's an online resource. It is open 24-7, like not many other things at the moment <laughs> in Victoria. And the whole idea of this is that uh, we have had a, an expert group of people pull the research together for effective literacy teaching in primary and secondary school. So they've saved us a lot of work. And they've put a toolkit together for us to help us as teachers to have a clear direction on what does effective literacy practice look like in schools. 
So it's all about developing students' content knowledge in each curriculum area. That's the secondary version. Uh, and building teachers' knowledge about what the possibilities could be for in integrating literacy into the curriculum areas. Now, the what's included... Uh, well, depends which which uh, version or which uh, subject or curriculum area that you're looking at in the high, in the seven to ten version. So you can find expert videos explaining literate practices. You can find and something I'm so excited about is their Victorian examples, Australian Victorian. Very exciting to have our own uh, state celebrating the great practice within it. So there's also curriculum specific resources, there's some teaching advice, there's uh, evidence based literacy teaching. Uh, I, I love it because it, they've taken the work away from us. We don't have to worry about, uh, you know, going and doing all the research ourselves. We come here as our first point of reference. Now, the toolkit is separated into primary and secondary, and I would strongly recommend if you're a Mylands teacher, if you're an EEL, if you're uh, in any role supporting the literacy development of students, do go and have a look at the primary toolkit as well. The primary toolkit is separated uh, by mode. So if you want to know reading, there's a section on reading, teaching, writing, uh, teaching, speaking and listening. And so there are some teaching practices in there. So particularly relevant for secondary Mylands teachers who are trying to bring up those struggling readers and writers, go into the primary toolkit and have a look at some of the teaching practices. The secondary toolkit is, a bit, is separated into curriculum areas, which makes more sense than separating into reading and writing and speaking and listening. So uh, at the moment we have English, maths, science and technologies have been unveiled uh, and we're waiting with bated breath for the humanities, the arts, PE. So those things will come out at some stage, you know, every, the, the timeline for everything has changed this year, not surprisingly. So uh, these are the ones that are available already. If you, and I see that we do have, someone uh, is a maths and science teacher in here, you definitely go and have a look at the maths and science resources because there's some really great stuff. Now, just because you're a technologies teacher doesn't mean you shouldn't look at the other curriculum areas. The English curriculum area has some really great resources and there are some links from the technologies back into the literacy, into the English one, uh, as the maths and science would also be useful for, particularly for the digital technologies teachers as well. So don't just have a look in one area, go and have a little poke around in all of them. And tonight I'm going to, we're going, we are going to go into literacy and technologies. Now, as I said before, it's been separated into two halves. Yeah. So we are going to look at the first half. So this is the Digitech, the computer-focused technologies uh, section. We're going to look at that one first. I'm not going to take you through every. I'm not going to let you see every single page. I'm just going to give you a tasting plate, um, not an actual one, uh, which would make sense if it was a food technologies, but it's not. I'm just going to give you an introduction. Okay. Now on this slide here, I've put a big red box around the outside of it so you can see that we've gone back to the start just so in case you get lost where we when we go on our tour our um, socially distanced tour so with there in each of the toolkits or in each of the curriculum areas for the toolkit there are four sections and they're all laid out exactly the same so there's always an introduction developing understanding communicating understanding and a and I just think of this one like it's a nice present. They wrap it all up, put a little bow on the top, and that's putting it all together. So introduction, well, that's pretty self-explanatory. The developing understanding section, if we think about the gradual release of responsibility, so at the top of that where the teacher is taking most of the responsibility for, for the work and for the learning, that's the developing understanding section. This is when our students are taking knowledge in, right? The communicating understanding section is when we've moved down the gradual release. This is when our students are producing, they're sending knowledge back out. Okay, so say in digital technologies, in the developing understanding, this is when we're starting to learn about coding, whereas in communicating, that's when we're producing our own. Can you see the difference? And then the last section, it provides... I really like this one because it provides sort of a suggested, well, not a suggested, a sample 
unit plan to say this is how the whole thing could work together. This is one example of how this might look. All right. So in the introduction to literacy in digital technologies, the first thing they do on this page is define the difference between literacy in digital technologies and digital literacy. So uh, I think, which I think it's a good idea that they've defined it because often those pe people think they're the same thing. So literacy in digital technologies, I think of this as, well, this is the reading and the writing that you need to be able to do to engage in the content. Whereas digital literacy, I think of this as well, being fluent in using technology. And I think they're, they're two different things, right? So the second one, digital literacy is being fluent in using technology, um, something that I've discovered that my mum isn't on our weekly Zoom sessions, still not working out how to show something other than her forehead in the Zoom session. We'll get there. Whereas literacy in digital technologies, this is the reading, the writing, uh, how you know all of the literacy skills that we need to engage in the text. So I see someone in the chat said about uh, an example that they have EAL students and they find the most important literacy skill is navigating different digital platforms. So the literacy skills that you need to navigate platforms is different from actually being fluent with the use of uh, the technology. Now, the other thing that I like about this is that it gives you an idea about what are the literate demands for this area, for digital technologies. So you can see lots of visual representation, diagrams, video. We can't just assume our kids know how to, uh, what to, how to interpret that or, or indeed create it themselves. Computer codes, obviously, being digital technology and images. And then if you look over on the right-hand side, that these are some of the texts that our students need to be able to read and produce. Very different to the English classroom. So information, e.g. a privacy statement. Well, that, the privacy statement, the purpose of that is absolutely to inform. It is not to engage. Procedural texts, technical texts, evaluative reports. These aren't things necessarily that our students are going to be taught in an English classroom. So they, you, in primary school they might look at some of these but not with the same level of exactness that's required in a digital technologies classroom, okay? So uh, particularly if we're talking about coding and uh, we're going to look at algorithms a bit later. So that's the first section. The second section, developing understanding, is when the knowledge is starting to come in. It's separated into three subsections. Uh, the first one is explicitly teaching programming vocab and genre structure. And I'm going to just do a little bit of a snippet on uh, going to the vocab part of it in a bit more depth later. Uh, jointly constructing input and output tables. So this section here focuses on the really important concept of cause and effect in digital technology. So if you're a digital technologies teacher, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Sort of, you know, that understanding of the if then. So if I do this, then this will happen, which I actually think is very useful for real life, thinking about that. So they have, they introduce this concept of uh, a cause and effect table. And uh, one suggestion is to get students to, or I think their suggestion was actually to look at a game such as Minecraft. And they would look at, well, what are the inputs that go into the computer? And what does the, what does the computer do when it receives that input? So if I press the space button, what is going to happen? My character is going to jump. So every time I, if space button is pressed, then character jumps. Okay, so that's uh, a lot of the toolkit for technologies is about using different graphic organisers to help students to organise their thinking and their learning. So that's just one of the examples there. The third one is about using graphic organisers to understand computer networks. So... This is, again, it's about how to use different graphic organisers and uh, helping them to organise all of the learning. And there's, a, there's an image and a sample image on the site about what, it might look, what a hardware uh, network might look like, what all the connections might look like, which lots of people who are setting up internet in their houses or, or changing to NBN would have been reading over these last few months, I dare say. Okay, so if we go back to the start... We've looked at introduction, 
and briefly looked at developing the understanding. Now we're going to look at the expressive part, so that the work the students are creating as a result of their learning in digital technologies. So firstly, they, uh, so they've got some sample work on using flowcharts to design algorithms. Obviously, they've explained what algorithms are first and then, you, and then introducing uh, the different images that students will need to use to create their own algorithm and their flow chart and why that's important. Then looking at how students can examine a problem faced by an end user uh, to rework it to be more inclusive. So uh, I think the colour, the one that they've used, the example they've used is that they have uh, colour blindness. So they have to look at a program and when work out what are some solutions, how could they make this program more inclusive to those experiencing colour blindness. Using graphic organisers to evaluate peer design digital solutions. A lot of evaluation obviously happens in uh, digital technologies because we're constantly looking and seeing, well, is that effective? Is that an effective solution? So if our students have created a, uh, maybe they've created some code or, or a website, we need to evaluate to say, is that an effective version of the website? Does it meet the brief? So in here, they've recommended uh, a PCQ chart, positives, challenges and questions. And uh, we instruct the students and think about gradual release of responsibility. We don't just hand this out. We have, you know, I model looking at a website myself. Uh, I model how I fill in this chart and how it helps me with my thinking before I ask the students to go off and do it. So too often we're sending, we're giving the kids this, telling them how to do it. We're not showing them. And then we're expecting them to be able to engage with this content fully. So we're going to pull ourselves back up that gradual release of responsibility. And then the final uh, section in, the, in that communicating understanding is about recognising layers of meaning. So this uh, looks at, it's well, it provides a good example of the way teachers can take the learning further to use their interpreting, analysing and evaluation skills in real life situations, which I really love that they use real life. So in here, um, they've got a really terrific example of, you know, students thinking, why do I need all these data analysis skills? When am I actually ever going to use this? Uh, what's the real world example? And the example they've provided in here is an AFL example. Uh, it's where they're teaching the students to triangulate the data. So, I mean, as teachers, we, we're sick to death of triangulating or hearing about triangulating. But the example here is that there's an, a real problem, and, and it was actually legitimately real. There's a link to a newspaper article. Uh, after an AFL match, there was overcrowding on the platforms in the at the train station. And so they're getting the students to look at different sources of data to work out what might be a solution to prevent this from happening again. So they're actually using a real world scenario and getting kids to come up with real world solutions. So uh, that is, it's a, quite interesting. And I think it would be an interesting activity for students to engage in. And finally, tying it all up, putting a little bow on the top. Uh, this is the putting it all together. So here they just provide a, an, oh, I guess a sample unit of work to say what this could look like, what the whole learning cycle could look like together. So uh, in here, the students are required to research a problem and then they have to come up with a digital solution for that problem. And it actually steps them through how to create the written report. So what do they need to include in the report uh, at, the, at the start of the report and summarising the, the problem? And then how do they present their digital solution? So. Yeah, I actually think that would be very useful for digital technologies teachers to think about. And all the way we're constantly thinking about, well, so say for the report, how do we expect our students to know how to write the report effectively? So I've got to go gradual release of responsibility and step them through by us modelling, demonstrating first, uh, how do we create each of the sections in that report? Okay, you're sitting there thinking, when does design and technologies get mentioned? Here is your time to shine. Design and technology. So this is the engineering um, systems. This is the food technologies. This is the woodwork, uh, all of those areas. What's the literacy? You know, what's what can we be thinking about in here? So again, this is separated. You can see into the same four uh, areas. So intro, developing, 
communicating and then wrapping it all up. So for the introduction here, again, they tell us what are the thing, the literate demands for this subject uh, or the subject area. So they're saying that their students will need to make informed decisions about the reliability of the information. So compare sources, assess the reliability. Goodness me, that is a life skill at the moment. Tracking changes to information over time. Create written plans that reflect an understanding of the factors of impacting design decisions. So there's actually a lot of uh, writing in here and there's a lot of talking, a lot of listening and understanding to, in order to be able to create or to, you know, create a design that suits a specific brief. On the right-hand side, design and technology students must access and communicate information from some of these genres. We think design briefs, persuasive texts, explanatory texts, planning and management documents. How do I read those? You know, what's the, what's the best way to interpret those? Graphic representation, very visual area. So as you can see, there is a lot more to woodwork or into sewing than to than just getting on the tools. There's a lot of literacy required to be successful in these fields. Now, a lot of what happens in design and technologies follows the design thinking process. So I've just put this pulled this diagram from the literacy teaching toolkit. These are the five stages of uh, the design thinking approach. And next to them, you can see the literate demands. So in the investigating stage, we're looking at asking questions, conducting research, defining problems. These, oh, I've got a, a typo in the parameters, but these, you could go back to the gradual release and think, well, how have we built the student's capacity to be able to use each of these literate, literate practices? So when it comes to conducting research, which is, oh, my goodness, that is one of the biggest ones that we just assume our kids know how to do that. Have we explicitly taught them how to conduct research? What does it look like? Where do I start? How do I even use the internet to find appropriate research? So then we go down to generate. We're looking at develop, document and communicating ideas, discussing options. Do our students have the capacity? I think someone put it in, in the chat about that, that idea of communication. So have we built their ability to communicate effectively with each other? Producing, recording findings. What, what might that look like? What might a good one look like? Evaluating, making judgments, sharing opinions, <laughs> receiving other people's opinions on your item without getting offended. Providing feedback. Providing feedback is, is another area that we too often assume that our kids just know how to do it, how to give effective feedback. And if you think, well, it's pretty crazy to think that our kids have that skill because as teachers, we are constantly working on our ability to provide feedback. It's hard work. It's something that we have to keep working on. You know, it's in, it's in the high impact teaching strategies. We have PD after PD on how to provide effective feedback. But then when it comes to peers giving feedback, we just assume our kids know how to do it. So that's, that's definitely an area that we've actually got to go back and do some explicit teaching on. Reflecting, oh, wow, that's a life skill. And then we get to the planning and managing stage and resolving conflict and issues. Well, that's also a life skill. So actually these are the design and technology. They're carrying a lot of weight here in, in a lot of life skills. We, we owe it to these teachers. I think we need to make sure we get this part right. So in the, if we go back to the start, in the second section, so I've done the introduction so we understand what's happening. And I think the beauty of the previous section, that introduction section, is that if you're a literacy coach in a school or if you're the literacy leader, you have to get your head around what are the literate demands in each of the different subject areas because I'm going to be working with each of those teachers and I need to understand how I can get in, how, what's my leg in to working with them to help build the literacy teaching in that area. So that first page I think is really useful, particularly for literacy uh, coaches across the school. Now in developing understanding, it, it's broken up into three areas. So using model texts to teach genre. Um, we'll see if I've got, we've got any time to go into that at the end. 
using graphic organizers to understand user needs and jointly deconstructing multimodal representations. That jointly deconstructing, I think, is really important because it's a way of going back up to the gradual release of responsibility. So rather than just having uh, a look at uh, some, let's say, uh, a video on how to sew a pillowcase together. I don't think I've got 10 out of 10 for the pillowcase. I wasn't, that wasn't my strength, the old pillowcase. How can we, so we, if we look at that video together as a group, then we need to be able to deconstruct it to say, well, what were the strengths of it? So then it, if I was to create my own video of how to create a, you know, sew a pillowcase together, then I want to make a strong video. So what are the elements of that? So we look at an effective one, we deconstruct it so that we can reconstruct our own one. Okay, if we go, if we look at communicating understanding, so we're now thinking about the, uh, the work that our students are producing in design and technologies, then we're looking at using genre guidelines to edit and revise text. I'm going to take you through what this could look like. We are looking at producing annotated concepts, sketches and drawings because as we know, in the design and technologies, a lot of it is visual. So when we're asking our students, this is one of the samples from the, from the toolkit, when we're asking our students to create an annotated uh, drawing, what does a good one look like? What are the elements that we need to make sure that we're including? So think about the hits, worked examples. Our students, we need to be really explicit about that. So in this example, they've asked the students to create a futuristic version of a bedside lamp and uh, get feedback on it and add more annotations. So in, this, in that section of the toolkit, they're talking about how can we help our students to produce more effective annotated concept sketches instead of just assuming that they're going to know how to do it. Joint construction of visual representations. This is that uh, the example is that they've uh, given a sustainability problem a uh, real world problem, uh, it's the Kunung Creek Trail. And so the students have had to create the uh, visual representation of the Kunung Creek and they've talked about how you would, what that would look like. And I just pulled this from the toolkit. They said, the use of diagrams, images and other visual text can support students to visualise, develop and plan solutions to problems. Traditional written communication does not enable students to develop multimodal communication skills, nor does it support students to explore the potential of technology to solve problems or meet specific needs. Which I think, well, this just for me reiterates why we can't leave this literacy teaching all up to the English teacher, because a lot of the work that they're doing in English is going to be about traditional written communication. But we know, particularly in the technologies, a lot of it is visual. So we've got to have that gradual release of responsibility instruction of visual and all of the different elements that go into visual texts. Oh, and I see someone in the chat has just said that they've used visual diaries with their students. Yes, and the instruction, you know, that explicit instruction that you need to use to help them to be able to get the most out of that. Right. Okay, the last part of this is teaching collaborative communication skills. And in here, they've, and I noticed some of you listed collaboration uh, or communication as an issue, as a literacy issue, which is rightly so, because the, we need, our students need a lot of this, uh, need this skill in spades, I guess, in the design, well, just in the normal world, but definitely in the design and technologies. So one suggestion or one uh, strategy provided in here is think ink, pair, share, where the problem is given to the students, they think about it and uh, they, so they think about it, they write their response down, then they pair up with another person, share their response, and then they share it with someone else. So that's one option for how we can build the collaborative skills. You also want to think about gradual release of responsibility for those students. Uh, because we can't just assume that they know how to have that collaboration. So let's talk about what does an effective discussion look like. Okay. 
The final section is putting it all together. So design and technology is putting it all together. And in here, they've provided an example of the students create a design brief. Uh, they have to outline the problem, uh, outline their targeted users, uh, outline the design requirements. And it actually shows you what the design brief looks like and steps through, you know, what, how, you, how you might go about teaching each of those steps. So there's some really terrific resources in here. It is very big because there's two different sections for, you know, the, the two different types of technology. Uh, but if you go in looking for one at a time, get your head around it, you should hopefully have a good understanding of some of the things that are available to you in the toolkit. Okay, I'm going to give you two minutes just to do a bit of reflection about what you've learnt about the Literacy Teaching Toolkit, maybe think about the areas that you might want to go into a bit further. I've got to put my timer on. And then we're going to look at some vocabulary and writing briefly. <laughs> All right, I've got my timer on for two minutes. Okay, I would love to see your questions. If you pop them in the chat, if you have um, what your questions are about the toolkit, because we have some of the team from the department, the toolkit team. I don't know, I don't think that's their official name, but they're online. So if you've got any questions, pop it in the chat and uh, hopefully we can get to those. Okay, in the last section tonight, I'm just going to dive in to uh, one, maybe two sections of the toolkit that I want to go over uh, in a bit more depth. Now, the first one is vocabulary. And the reason I've selected vocabulary is because it's a topic that, or it's, it's a, an area of literacy that can go across both design digital technologies and design technologies, and indeed all curriculum areas. And also because the research is so strong on the impact of vocabulary instruction. So, and I noticed that some of you uh, have commented in the chat about that vocabulary is the area that your students need to work on. Uh, so that's why I've selected this as something that I'd like to go a bit deeper on tonight. Okay, so uh, vocabulary instruction, vocabulary knowledge is content knowledge. Now, I wanted to put this up here because sometimes people think, oh, I'm already teaching all my content and now you want me to teach vocabulary as well. Well, that's a literacy thing. That's not my content. So I just want to clarify, vocabulary knowledge or time spent in every subject is on teaching vocabulary is actually teaching your content. It's not separate to that. Research reveals that vocab knowledge is the single best indicator of students' reading ability, comprehension, 
and familiarity with academic discourse. And because of this, vocab knowledge is one of the best predictors of student success in school. Well, that is a glowing report for the investment that a teacher makes when they slow down and spend time on explicit vocabulary instruction. Okay, so this, I got grabbed this from the toolkit, the science part of the toolkit, but it's still relevant to every uh, vocabulary instruction. Argue that methods of teaching vocab that focus on students copying definitions from a textbook is problematic. So when we're talking about vocab instruction, we're not just saying leave three minutes at the start of the lesson, get the kids to copy down these definitions, because we know that that's not an effective way of getting our kids to really deeply understand the vocabulary required for the topic. The reason for that, definitions in isolation can be too broad or too narrow, have no direct link to the topic being taught, especially if the um, word has multiple meanings. Number two, students may copy definitions absentmindedly. <laughs> Who has those kids? Uh, and, of course, you know, then they've written down the wrong definition. I've had those kids. That's who's had them. Uh, and number three, identifying definitions within a passage of text may lead to incomplete or incorrect definitions. So if we're not just focusing, if we're not just copying definitions off the board, how are we getting our kids to understand the vocabulary? Well, for this, I'm going to bring in Beck and McCown's uh, three tiers of vocabulary instruction. Now, it doesn't matter which subject area, what year level you're working with, these three tiers remain the same. So firstly, there's tier one. Now, tier one are your everyday words. I say these are the words that we use in everyday conversation, right? So I've put some examples on the side there. Word, number, table. These are words that our kids are more than likely going to come up with in everyday conversation. Tier two are more academic words. These are the words that are more likely to be exposed to in academia, so in school or in reading. So if you think about, I've got words like evaluate, justify, analyse, contrast. They don't all have to be verbs, solution, uh, but these are words that you're not always going to hear out in the yard uh, when you're out on yard duty because they're more words that we would use in academia, okay? The third level, tier three, these are domain-specific words. So when we're thinking about disciplinary literacy, these are the words that we're thinking, what are the, what's the vocabulary specific to my discipline? So digital technologies it has its own language. You know, we're talking about algorithms. We're talking about debugging. When I'm in primary school, I'm talking about debugging. I'm talking about getting nits out of kids' hair. But in high school, when I'm in digital technologies, talking about debugging, I'm talking about finding where in the code is the issue that's causing the problem with my, the software that I've just created or the, or the program that I've just created. A butt joint, a hem, genetically modified. These are all words that are specific to a certain domain and not always likely to be found outside of that domain. Now, tier two and tier three are the ones that we've got to think about explicit instruction on. If you have a high AAL population, the depends which or where they're coming from, but sometimes you'll need to do instruction in tier one words as well. Uh, one of the Beck and McCown's research would suggest that tier one words, even for uh, new English language learners, will they'll become across those, they'll be able to develop their skills in that, say, in the first 18 months of being exposed, uh, immersed in that language in, in their new country. But tier two and three, if we don't do explicit instruction around these, our students might never come across them and they're really important words to be able to succeed in academia. So let's take justify. If our students don't understand what justify means and we've given them an assessment and it says justify the reason for this and our students don't understand what it is they're actually being asked to do, then it's not really a fair test of, of their actual knowledge on the topic. We're actually testing their vocabulary knowledge instead. So here I've said on the side, explicitly teach tier two and three words and this will allow our students to access and communicate their content knowledge, okay? The other thing about vocab instruction is we don't uh, learn words one at a time. So uh, we often, when we're learning one word, we often learn a bunch of other words that come with it. We need to engage in lots of talk. 
So our students need to roll the words around on their tongue. They need to practice saying them in different situations. So it's not enough for us just to stand at the front and say, this is the word, I'm going to say it. We need our kids to be repeating them, saying them over and over in different contexts. And then if you have a look at the third dot point, oh my goodness, have a look at this. We need on average 12 to 15 exposures to learn that word. Wow. Well, that, how about, how does copying the definition off the board fit in with 12 to 15 exposures? Well, that's your first exposure. Now you've got to provide, you know, 11 to 14 more exposures. So we've got to think, how are we immersing our students in this vocabulary? How are we making sure they get these exposures so that they can add that word to their vocabulary and understand what it means? And how is that they need to read it, they need to hear it, they need to say it, they need to write it. So they've got to be engaging with the words as much as possible. I've put this here, a myth of vocabulary is that one either knows a word or does not know a word. So Beck and McCann say, actually, that's not true. It's not, you don't either, you don't know it or not know it. There's actually levels of knowing a word. So you can have absolutely no knowledge of it all of the way to a rich decontextualized knowledge. So I, not only do I know the word in that context, I can put it in a different context. I can, you know, I can play with it. I understand that word. So if you think about the word algorithm, where would you place yourself on this scale? Say no knowledge is one, all of the way up to rich decontextualized knowledge is a five. Where would you place your knowledge of the word algorithm, of the meaning for the word algorithm? So thinking, hmm, never heard of it? Or, yeah, I've heard of it. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Or I know several meanings. I'm just not exactly sure which one to use in the right context. So I sort of think sometimes it's like, you know a word but not well enough to use it in a social setting. So sometimes if, I, if I'm learning a new word, I'll test it out of my husband who sometimes is a better audience than other people. Sometimes he'll let me know, uh, well, <laughs> loud and clear, but I've used it in the wrong context. Uh, or do you totally know, uh, totally understand the word algorithm and feel very confident to use it in all different contexts? So here, when we're thinking about vocab instruction, one thing that we can do for our students is we want them to see that their own definitions are changing and shifting so I've put included it in your activity pack. We can put the, they can write the word down in a table, write their current definition, and then when we do some work on it, then they can come back and update their definition. So for algorithm in the toolkit, well, we're not going to do this because I want to get to the writing. In the toolkit, there's a video, a link to a video, and uh, this professor actually explains algorithm in a very clear way. It's a, it's a terrific explanation. So after we've watched his explanation of algorithm, and if you're a digital technologies teacher, this definition is fantastic for you because he talks about that difference between, you know, when we when we uh, when our students create a procedural text, the level of information that they need to include versus when they're creating uh, a flow chart, an algorithm flow chart, the level of information they need to include has to be so precise or the code won't work. So we've watched our video, we've talked about algorithms, and then we're going to come back here and update our definition of what, the, of what we think algorithm means now. Another uh, suggestion is to use a student dictionary. So every time we learn a new word, we can go back and add that to our dictionary. In fact, when I was learning French in high school, we used to have one of these, and it was a very effective uh, strategy, I must say. The final strategy that I'm going to present is a Freya model. The Freya model is where you put the word in the middle. So in this instance, I've used electrical insulator. And then we have our students write a definition, uh, a fact. They could do a drawing or a diagram and then provide an example. So it's just another way of getting multiple exposures to the words. So we're not going to do this for every single word. We're going to do this for the really important ones, okay? So maybe, um, for, maybe we've... So tech, say technical vocab for digital technologies or maybe we look at that tier two vocab and we realise that in our assessments, lots of kids, when we were saying analyse, they weren't really understanding what that entailed and what we were asking. So we're going to use that as, as, a, as one of our words. Okay, so that's our very brief 
<laughs> in to light touch on vocabulary. The other thing I just wanted to finish off with is, is looking at writing in the technologies curriculum, in the technologies classroom, both for if you're a literacy teacher supporting a technologies teacher or if you're a technologies teacher yourself and you're thinking, well, how can I build the writing capacity of my students? So uh, I wanted to share this quote from the toolkit, genres or text types that achieve the same social purpose tend to have similar structural patterns. So we know that, you know, when we're writing a, a, a food recipe, we know that we usually start with a heading, sometimes there's a little summary, then we're going to get our materials or our, sorry, our ingredients, going to need to use the right vocabulary, and then we're going to have our method, okay? So we know that there's a generally a, a, a specific pattern or a structure to follow. When students understand the structures as well as the purpose of the generic structures, they're better able to produce the text. Well, I don't think that's a huge surprise. In design and technologies, if designed products are going to be reproduced, and that's, you know, if we're in design and technology and we're, and we're creating a design for something and we do want other people to produce it, we want to go viral, <laughs> then we need to create uh, some procedural steps so that others can cre recreate whatever it is that we've made. Probably the great example of this is masks at the moment, yeah? Face masks, you see all of these uh, procedures being sent out and shared on the internet for how to make the best, best mask and you make, make some quick dollars if you can produce some quick ones. So when it comes to genre instruction, so if we're, whether we're teaching our kids to write a procedural text or not just write, sorry, create, because they might be making a video uh, or a podcast or whatever it is, We've got to take them through this gradual release. We need to just to not assume that they will automatically come to us knowing how to write an evaluation report or a procedural text. So we've got to think, well, I need to move myself up the gradual release and I've got to model it to them. They need to see some good ones. And I always say for this, if you think about when you write, which a lot of teachers will admit they don't write themselves, one thing, if you say you're applying for a job or even a, or even a grant for some money, uh, the first thing that we tend to do is say, well, have you got some examples for me so I can have a look at them so I know what I'm supposed to be producing here? What does a good one look like? And then we read them and we think, oh, okay, so, you know, they've included this and they've got this and, okay, and then we have confidence to go off and have a go at writing our own. Well, that's what our kids need. So they need us to provide some examples of successful versions of whatever genre it is. Uh, and so if you're a literacy coach working with a technologies teacher, it's really about getting them to understand what are the elements in, uh, the, in the genre that they're asking their kids to write in and helping build the technology teacher's understanding of those different elements. Because for them, it might be second nature. And in fact, it is harder for us when we're proficient writers in the field to be able to go back to the start and say, oh, yeah, what knowledge would a new writer or a new, you know, someone that's new to this subject need to know to be able to create this? So how do we do it? Well, we immerse our kids in other examples. So if we're talking about recipes, we're not going to, we're better off and the more effective teaching is not for us to stand up and go, okay, guys, the this is the instruction sheet for how to create an effective recipe. We're going to look at some examples. And we're going to say, okay, well, how did Tony Tan do it in his cookbook? How did Rick Stein do it in his cookbook? What are the common elements here? And let's create some guidelines for ourselves to craft from. So we're using these as mentor texts. If we're looking at uh, multimodal texts, we're going to watch a few different ones, some good ones and some bad ones. And we're going to say, what elements did the good ones have? You know, what was the language they used? How did they structure it? Did they tell us at the start, all of the materials that we needed or did they tell us as they went along? How long did it go for? How did they make it shorter? What did they leave out? What did they show? You know, what was the position of the camera even? How, uh, what was the lighting like? How did they get clear audio? So we've got to look at these things to create a bit of a recipe or guidelines for ourselves to think, okay, well, this is how I could then go and create my own piece in that same genre. So on the toolkit, there's an example of a woodwork. They've got a link to a video uh, in Fuse 
and they've listed this is these are the guidelines that one class has come up with for an effective explanation when creating a video about how to do something in woodwork right clear naming visual example list of materials and i think for this that i've been watching that um what's that guy's name he's on facebook and he's telling people how to cook nat and that's what i reckon i notice he's starting to sharpen up the way that he does it so now he produces a visual list of these are all the cooking ingredients that you mean that you need because people send him feedback to say stop telling us as you go along give us a list at the start so when we've looked at lots of other examples then we can start to create our own idea and as the example is on the toolkit we can start to create our own list of well this is how to this is how to set out a successful one so when i go to write my own i'm going to follow that same sort of recipe or that same guide those same guidelines so then i'm effective in that so if you're a literacy teacher working with the digital technologies people or the technologies teachers you can help them to construct to pull apart their text type so they can teach that to their students explicitly okay wow we're at the end Here's the, uh, if you're after more, if you're after more resources for disciplinary literacy, unfortunately, these texts are all American and they don't recognise digital technologies or design uh, and design thinking as a subject area. But if you're a literacy teacher, these would be useful for you working with the other areas. Uh, I am going to leave you with the understanding goals for the session and the success criteria and wish you well. Uh, don't forget that the Literacy Teaching Toolkit is 24-7, so you'll be able to go and have a look uh, yourselves and at any stage to familiarise yourselves. Basto also have on the YouTube channel for Basto, they've got a video for the English, Maths and Science part of the, the toolkits as well. So if you want to catch up on those ones and you'll be able to skip the first section because I uh, repeated it tonight. So thanks everyone for joining us and uh, I'll see you at the next one when I'm talking about humanities. So we look forward to that. Enjoy your holidays.